Welcome to Very Old Money, a podcast that looks at history through money. Episode 3.5 The Sacred War. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back. Sorry it has been such a long, long, long time. The day job interfered again, and then work had to be adjusted to work from home. And now that the COVID outbreak has been trapped at home for the foreseeable future, hopefully this will be up on a more regular basis. As a guide for where we are going, I intend to wrap up the story of Philip in the next three episodes before moving on to Alexander. This is way longer than I expected to spend on Philip, so I shudder to think how verbose I will be about Alexander, but let's see how this goes. A quick announcement before we begin, if you are listening to this podcast on YouTube instead of regular podcatchers, please hit the subscribe button below the video. Also, please make sure to hit the bell icon to the right and choose all notifications. That way, you will be automatically notified by email as soon as new episodes load. If the coins I mention in today's episode do not show up in the cover art at your podcatcher, You can view all the coin images on my website at veryoldmoney.com. We have four coins at the cover art today and a new source. The coins are from Agora Auctions and you can visit them at agoraauctions.com. So on with the show. So in the last episode, we saw Philip establish Macedon as as the strongest power in Greece. And in this episode, the rest of Greece will find out about it. Now, in a bunch of previous episodes, we have mentioned the Oracle at Delphi, which by this time had a powerful reputation over much of the Greek world. Control over the Oracle and the revenues it brought was important, and this had already triggered two wars. As a result of these wars, the great Amphictyonic League that was organized to support the temples of Apollo and Demeter gradually morphed into a military alliance. The council of this league had religious authority and the power to pronounce punishments against offenders. And this included expulsion or wars. And these wars were termed sacred wars. Of course, once you create such a league, the more powerful members of the league will use it for their own ends. And by the 6th century BC, the league was being used as a tool for the larger cities in the league to put pressure on smaller ones. The Oracle of Delphi had previously belonged to the city of Crissa, but had become independent. Naturally, peeved, the people of Crissa started levying a quote-unquote tax, which basically was robbery of pilgrims going to Delphi. After efforts to resolve this failed, the Amphictyonic League declared the first sacred war against Crissa. This war lasted from 595 to 585, though there's some dispute whether the war actually went on that long, and it ended with the destruction of Crissa. And, to commemorate the end of this war, the Pythian Games were organized and were held every four years. The Second Sacred War, about 150 years later, was a back-and-forth affair over the control of Delphi again, and this was a sideshow in the Greater Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta. It kicked off in 449-448 BC, with the Phocians trying to become masters of the sanctuary at Delphi, but being kicked out by a Spartan army. Then the Athenians, under Pericles, intervened and gave back rule of Delphi to the Phocians, and this included management of the Pythian games. However, Phocian control of Delphi likely did not last long, and it likely ended after Athenians were defeated by the Boeotian League the next year. And in 421 BC, after the peace of Nicias, Delphi was autonomous again. A century later, it was time for yet another sacred war, and again, this one would involve the Phocians. This was a decade-long war between 356 and 346, and it pulled in almost all the powers of Greece. Armies need money to function, and this war more than most went on so long because the side that on paper was heavily overmatched had unexpected access to lots and lots of money. The official flashpoint for the war was the refusal of the Phocians to pay a fine imposed by the Amphictyonic League for illegal cultivation on sacred land. Now, were the Phocians guilty? Yeah. The problem was that the fine imposed was way too high for them to pay. So why did the League act this way? 
The likely motivation was that Thebes was using this to settle scores. In addition to the Phocians, the League also tried to ding the Spartans. And why the Phocians? Because the Phocians had not participated in the Mantinea campaign, which we discussed in a previous episode against Sparta. At this point, the Phocians were also exposed because their primary ally in Thessaly was dead. And this ally will be discussed in a supplemental episode that I will announce at the end of this episode. While Athens was also distracted by the social war, which was mentioned in last episode. As noted in the last episode, Philip used that war and Athenian distraction to his advantage in Macedonia. And Thebes likewise decided this was a chance to take care of focus. Now, failure to pay this fine made the offenders outcasts and the targets of a potential sacred war. With Thessaly racked by civil war, Thebes was able to pick on the Phocians and even the Spartans. And why were the Spartans? Because Sparta had previously occupied Thebes before they had been humiliated in coming years, as we had discussed in another previous episode. Now, here the Thebans overreached because it was pretty clear the League was being used for political reasons. But at the same time, many states did not want to be accused of condoning impiety. And we are going to see impiety on a grand scale. Now, if the Thebans had felt that the Phocians would meekly submit, they found out they were sorely mistaken. Led by Philomelus of Ledon, the Phocians decided on a preemptive strike to take Delphi itself and claim by controlling Delphi they were the leaders of the Amphictyonic League and thereby nullify the judgment against them. By picking on Sparta, Thebes had given Phocus, a ready-made ally, and the Spartan king, Archimedes III, gave Philomelus 15 talents to raise troops. Now, a talent is an ancient measure of wealth, which is about 6,000 drachma. With this, Philomelus raised a mercenary army, and with added Phocian troops, easily captured Delphi. All this before the fine was actually due. Now, with some score settling with local nobles who had supported the fine, Imposed by the League, this gave Philomelus even more money. A relief expedition by the city of Locris was defeated, and the prisoners were thrown from the cliffs over the sanctuary, which was the traditional punishment for sacrilege. Now, this is an early sign that this was going to be a brutal war. Now, after this victory, Philomelus fortified Delphi and destroyed the stones recording the verdict against the Phocians, and then he got the oracle to give him a reading that basically said, He could do what he wanted, which justified his actions. And then he sent out embassies to the Greek states, asserting the Phocian claim to Delphi and promising that they would not touch the treasury. Hint, hint, that promise is not going to last very long. Now, since by destroying the stones, he had technically erased the fines imposed on Sparta, the Spartans were more than happy to back him. And Athens was inherently hostile to Thebes and was supportive. As I mentioned earlier, Athens had not forgotten that Thebes had wanted to destroy Athens at the end of the Peloponnesian War. And 50 years later, Athens still carried that grudge. Unfortunately, the Locrians wanted revenge and the declaration of a sacred war. Obviously, throwing prisoners off a cliff is unlikely to give you the warm and cuddly feeling. Most Greek states, including the Amphictyonic League, were on board, and the League managed to get a few other states on board for pious reasons. And once war was declared, Philomelus realized he needed a bigger army. And for that, he needed money. And since he decided he needed mercenaries, he needed lots and lots of money. Luckily for him, by taking Delphi, he had the treasury of Apollo in his possession, which contained lots and lots of money. Unfortunately, this cause was now considered sacrilegious. But money was able to overcome these qualms. And by raising the going rate for mercenaries by half he was able to raise 10,000 troops. As the campaigning began the next year, Philomelus took the initiative, hoping to defeat Locris and occupy the pass at Thermopylae, yes, the same one that was made famous during the Persian Wars, and then prevent the Thessalian and Boeotian armies from uniting. Now, while he initially defeated the Thessalians and the Locrians, he was unable to prevent them from linking with the Boeotians, and with his numerical advantage lost, he withdrew. The Boeotian commander, Pamenes, ordered his army to march into Phocis, and the two armies met at the Battle of Neon, and the result was a heavy defeat of the Phocians. 
Injured in the battle, Philomelus threw himself off Mount Parnassos to avoid capture, which is an ironic coda to his treatment of the Locrians the previous year. His brother, Onomarchus, managed to salvage the rest of the army and retreated to Delphi. Now this is where the war should have ended. The Thebans surely appear to have thought so because to the bewilderment of posterity and probably the later regret, they did not immediately march on to focus. Instead, after winning his big victory, Pamines withdrew to Thebes with his army and the Thebans actually promised 5,000 troops to aid a Persian satrap, Artabazus, in his revolt against the great king of Persia. And it appears these soldiers were actually sent off before the Thebans realized to their disbelief that the overmatched Phocians were not suing for peace. This was because Onomarchus convinced the Phocians they had no choice but to continue the war. If the initial fine was ridiculous, the additional fine after they had taken Delphi, helped themselves to the treasury and thereby committing further sacrilege would be much, much worse. Phokia literally had its back to the wall and victory was their only option. Now, of course, it did not help Onomarchus while he was quote-unquote persuading the Phokians. He controlled the treasury at Delphi and through that the mercenary army. So with the die cast, Onomarchus expanded his treasury, first by executing and confiscating the property of his political opponents and then going full hog in looting Delphi. This included melting the gold and silver offerings down to coin them and the bronze and iron dedications to make weapons. Now tragically, a lot of classical Greek art from these offerings was lost in the process. But at the end of winter, Onomarchus had 20,000 men and 500 cavalry, which gives us the chance to segue into the first coin in the cover art today, which is in the top row on the left. It is a Phokian tetrabol issued between 356 and 354 BC of 2.75 grams. The obverse has a facing bull's head, which is a traditional symbol of Phokis, and the reverse has the head of Apollo with a branch behind him. Now, this one was listed as a tetrabol. You will sometimes see this coin listed as a hemidram, and I'll get into the vagaries of identifying small silver coinage later when we get to the other silver coin in the cover art. The imagery on this coin is actually a slight shift from traditional Phokian imagery, which had depicted Apollo's twin sister Artemis. But having taken possession of the preeminent temple to Apollo in Greece, this makes sense. In 354 BC, Onomarchus was on the move with campaigns against Locris, Doris, and Boeotia, but then he got sucked into a civil war in Thessaly. Now, most of Thessaly was allied with the League, but the city of Pherae was allied with the Phocians. Now, four years earlier, in 358 BC, the city of Larissa had called on our friend Philip II of Macedon for help against Pherae. Now, we don't know whether this invasion of Thessaly involved actual fighting on Philip's behalf. Philip's intervention helped Larissa get a better deal against the tyrants of Pherae. But Philip also entered this campaign with a wife from each city. And his role may have been primarily to help negotiate a peace while boosting his own power. Now the first wife, Philina of Larissa, appears to have been a dancer from the city and would become the mother of his son, Aridaeus. The second wife, Nicesipolis of Ferai may have been a cousin of the ruling tyrants and a niece of an earlier tyrant, Jason. Thessaly provided the best cavalry in Greece and Philip was deeply interested in his fate. And now four years later, he was called to intervene there again. Since Ferai was allied with the Phocians, Larissa called on Philip's help to help defeat them. Now, the initial force sent by Onomarchus under his brother Phialos was repulsed. So Onomarchus marched his entire army into Thessaly. And he also suddenly outnumbered the army Philip had brought and inflicted two defeats on him, forcing Philip to withdraw for the winter. But Philip had not withdrawn permanently. He was back next year and he forced the Thessalians to join him and he came with an army of 20,000 foot and 3,000 horse. He also cloaked himself in the rhetoric of the sacred war, presenting himself as an avenger of Apollo and sending his troops into battle wearing crowns of laurel, a symbol of Apollo. He also laid siege to Pagasai, the port of Ferai, which prevented it from being reinforced by sea, and notably this prevented the contingent sent by Athens from joining up with the Phocians. The Battle of Crocus Field was one of the bloodiest in Greek history. 
The result was a decisive victory for Philip. 6,000 Phokians were killed, including Onomarcos. Now the details about Onomarcos' death vary by source. Some have him plunging into the sea to reach the Athenian ships offshore and drowning. Diodorus has him captured and executed. Pausanias says he was killed by the darts of his own soldiers. 3,000 Phokian troops were taken prisoner and then they were drowned as a ritual execution for temple robbers. Posthumous vengeance was inflicted on the corpse of Onomarcos, which was crucified for his sacrilege. There is also another postscript to the Battle of Crocus Field. The same day of the battle, Nicesipolis of Ferrae gave birth to a daughter. Hearing of the news, Philip proclaimed that the daughter should be named Victory in Thessaly, and so the little child was named Thessaloniki. Nike being the Greek word for victory, and today is more commonly known as the name of a brand of sneakers. Sadly, Nicesipolis of Ferrae died soon after giving birth to little Thessaloniki. And the little child was raised by her stepmother, Olympias, who actually was friends with her mother as her own child. Thessaloniki was just a child during the remainder of Philip's reign and of Alexander, but when he died, she became a part of the story in the wars of the successors. And we will get to her in the future. Thessaloniki's name lives on even today through the name of the second largest city in Greece. This battle made Philip the master of Thessaly, and the Thessalians appointed him Archon, which gave him control of the revenues of their confederation and leadership of their army. Philip finished off the siege of Pagasai, and the tyrant of Ferrai surrendered the city and was allowed to leave with 2,000 mercenaries to focus. Now, after tightening his grip on Thessaly, Philip marched on to Thermopylae, which would have given him the opportunity to invade Phocis. Now, the alarmed Athenians sent a force to occupy the pass. Not wanting to spoil the warm afterglow of his great victory, Philip did not force the issue and withdrew from the conflict to focus on other military ventures, including one against the Thracians. And yet, incredibly, the Phocians were not ready to quit. After two huge military disasters, each claiming a brother, Onomarcos' brother Phaelos played now paid mercenaries double the rate to replenish his army. Once again, control of the treasury at Delphi let a hopeless situation continue and the war would drag on for another six years. And now Philip was not involved in this fighting after his victory, and the war between Phokia and Boeotia slowly turned into a stalemate. Phylos himself died of disease a year after Crocus Field, and the Phokians were down to their fourth general, Phalakios, the son of Onomarcos. The Phokians occupied some Boeotian towns, but by now they started running low on money as the great treasury of Delphi was finally running out. It has been estimated that Phokis spent 10,000 talents of the treasure during the war. Meanwhile, the Thebans were unable to finish the Phokians off on their own and finally called Philip for aid, as only an outside intervention could finally end this long war. Phokia itself was running into instability. Phalakios had been removed from power and replaced. Now, Philip's involvement in the sacred war also was related to his ongoing conflict with Athens, which we discussed in the last episode. And again, they were conveniently on opposite sides of this conflict. Philip's former ally, the Chalcidian League, was alarmed by his rise and had switched sides only to be destroyed. Even though some in Athens by now wanted peace, the war had continued. And finally, in 346, Philip prepared a march south. The Phocians planned to defend Thermopylae and ask for Athenian and Spartan help. The Spartans dispatched King Archimedes III with 1,000 Oplites, and the Athenians ordered everyone eligible for military service under the age of 40 to get ready to march. However, before these troops could arrive, Phalakios suddenly returned to power in focus and told the Athenians and the Spartans to stay away. So what happened? It's not clear, but historians have suggested that Phalakios' rise to return to power was basically a military coup by the unpaid Phokian army. And once he got back into power, Phalakios realized that the Phokians were out of money and there was no hope to win the war. An allegedly religious war started because one side did not have the money to pay a fine, ultimately ended when they ran out of money to keep fighting the war. 
the exhausted Phokians sued for peace. This set the dominoes falling. Since Thermopylae was not defensible, Athens itself was not secure. And by the end of February 346, the Athenians had sent an embassy to Philip to discuss peace terms. And on the 23rd of April, they entered into a peace treaty with Philip. Having entered into the treaty, they sent a second embassy to get peace oaths from Philip and found to their surprise, embassies from all the main combatants of the sacred war were present in the Macedonian capital of Pella. After a decade of exhausting war, the Thebans and the Thessalians wanted Philip to punish Phocus, while the allies of the Phocians, Sparta and Athens begged him not to. Now Philip did not make a commitment either way, and he did not give Athens the peace oaths that they asked for. Instead, he prepared his army for a campaign against a rebellious city in Thessaly. And as he marched, he took the Athenian ambassadors along with him. And when they reached Ferrai, he gave them the peace oaths. And so the relieved Athenian ambassadors returned home, only to find that the Thessalian campaign was a feint. By the time the embassy returned home, they discovered Philip had sent troops and taken the pass at Thermopylae. And as a result of this, even if the Athenians wanted to, they were in no position to save focus. Before the news of these maneuvers had reached Athens, on the 9th of July, Phokian ambassadors had come asking for Athenian help. And Athens, unaware of the situation at Thermopylae, started preparing for war. But when the news arrived three days later that Philip had taken the pass, the war party rapidly lost power and the Athenian army immediately changed course and passed a resolution confirming the peace treaty with Philip. With control of Thermopylae, Philip now was in a position to dictate terms to anybody. Philakios surrendered focus in condition for being allowed to leave with his mercenaries and he would be killed in battle three years later. Boeotia received its cities back from focus, but then Philip caused some panic in Athens by dictating that the fate of Phocus would be decided by the council of the Amphictyonic League. Why was Athens panic-stricken? Because it had been an ally of Phocus in the war and was guilty of sacrilege too. But here Philip was again playing the puppeteer. Macedon replaced Phocus as a member of the council and received the two votes previously held by Phocus. Phocus of course got harsh terms but not as harsh as some suggested. Some of the cities had recommended that the punishment for temple robbers being pushed over to the cliff be carried out on the whole Phokian population. The Phokian cities were destroyed and the inhabitants were resettled in smaller villages. The money taken from the temple of Apollo was supposed to be paid back. But while the cities were destroyed, the Phokians were still in Phokia and they were not eliminated, transported or sold into slavery. And in a few years, they, st- they disregarded their obligation to pay back the money and started refounding their cities. Athens and Sparta escaped punishment. And then having wrapped matters up, Philip went home satisfied he was the master of Greece. So before we wrap up, let's take a look at the remaining three coins in the cover art. The first in the top right is in silver. The two at the bottom are in bronze. Now this is a fairly common type of Philip and some of the most affordable coins featured in the cover art so far. The first coin in silver is a hemidram in the name of Philip of 15.17 millimeters and 2.54 grams, minted in Amphipolis between 323 and 316 BC. Now people who know their history know this is well after Philip was dead, so more on this date later. The obverse has the head of Apollo with the laurel wreath facing right, the reverse has Philippoi in Greek, that means off Philip, and a youth riding a horse to the right. And there's an A below the wreath, and the surfaces of this coin are a little bit grainy. The next two are the same style, but in bronze. The first is an AE18 unit of 18.42 millimeters, 6.40 grams, an unknown mint. Here Apollo with his hair bound in the Tainia is facing left. And the reverse again has the text Philippoi and the naked youth on horseback prancing right and an uncertain vertical linear object below the horse. The other bronze coin is a 17 unit of 5.28 grams. Apollo this time is facing right. And the reverse again has a youth riding to the right with Philippoi above him and A below. The rider this time is wearing a hat, a petasos. So a few observations about this coin. 
as you can see, you can make a different variety of the coin facing left or facing right. And you have varieties with Apollo and the Rider facing left, right, and not always in the same direction. Now I mentioned the coin, the bronze coins as an AE18 and an AE17 unit. And the bronze coins are often listed with a diameter. And that's what the 17 and the 18 stand for. Now for many bronze coins, we actually do not know the specific unit denominations. So today we classify them by weight and size. Now these are the coins that were used for everyday small transactions and the weight standards are not always as precise as the silver coins. Now correspondingly, there's a debate about the actual denomination of the silver coin that is listed here. You will sometimes see it listed as a hemidram, sometimes as a one-fifth tetradram. Now that always does not make sense since a dram is one-fourth of a tetradram. A hemidram by definition would be one-eighth. Complicating this, sometimes this is called a tetrabowl which is four obols. The obols are the silver small change for a drum and six obols made a drum. Now, if you're a math major, these fractions don't make sense at all because they don't come to the same weight and they are obviously not the same denomination. So why is there such a big discrepancy in the denomination of the silver coin? Now, with age and wear, the weight of these coins is over a wide range and the actual weight of the coin basically satisfies what would be the weight of the specific denomination. We also don't know what ancient specifically called some of these small denominations silver. And so sometimes the description is based on whatever the original cataloger of the coin preferred. Now, one thing, as I mentioned, the date of the silver coin, based on dye varieties and other marks, shows that this coin was minted after Philip's death. So, on the one hand, this could be a posthumous issue continuing after Philip's death, but obviously we had the reign of Alexander in the middle. So what is more likely that this coin was issued in the name of King Philip, but not King Philip II. It was issued in the name of King Philip III, Aridaeus. And yes, you heard the name Aridaeus earlier in the podcast. We'll come across him in greater detail in two episodes, and he will play a major and tragic, albeit passive role in our story once we get to the wars of the successors. So I listed the silver coin here for two reasons. One is to introduce the concept of posthumous coinage. When you start having succession troubles or political instability, sometimes it's easier to keep minting coins of an earlier and recognized king in a familiar style. The other is a concept of repurposing coin types by a later ruler for legitimacy. As we'll discover later, Philip III's claim to legitimacy ultimately derived from his relationship to his two previous predecessors. And as a result, it made sense for coins of Philip II to be reissued for Philip III by Philip III's supporters. Also, as I noted in the description of the coins, there are marks below the horse. Many times in the obverse or reverse fields, you see letters, monograms, etc. Now these often serve one of two purposes. One of these was as control marks. These allowed the mint to keep track of the date of the issue the coins minted by that specific die, the amount of coins used, the amount of metal used. The other purpose is sometimes as a mint mark. When a state was issuing coins from various mints, you may want to identify again for record keeping purposes which mint was producing the coin. Also, some control marks were used only with certain mint marks. This is another way to keep track of which mint issued what coin and make it easier to identify lazy forgeries. Mint marks are still used today. In the United States, mint marks were created to distinguish coins minted at locations other than Philadelphia, the site of the first national mint. So initially, Philadelphia minted coins with no mint mark, and those in Denver carried a D, San Francisco, and S, West Point, a W. Over time, the Philadelphia Mint was allowed to carry a P. Now, the rules on Amer which American coins carry mint marks vary, and we are digressing way outside our topic. But I just wanted to point out an ancient method of marking coins that survives to this day. A final note on this coin is the rider galloping away on the horse. Now, some people have speculated this is an image of Alexander riding his famous horse, Bucephalus. Now, it is very likely at this time Alexander was the presumed heir, and this is something we will get into much greater detail two episodes from now. 
and the former king Amantus IV is never really mentioned as a likely successor, but there's nothing really to support this theory. Some people list the boy as an Ephib, a youth in military training, but some coin types of Philip had the youth riding the horse holding a palm, which was given to the winner of the Olympic Games. And Philip was an enthusiastic participant at the Olympics to puff up his Greek credentials and stop chatter of him being referred to as a barbarian. Philip's horses won the chariot races and he also won the horseback races. The jockeys in the horseback races were likely young boys and they rode without a saddle or a stirrup which had not yet been invented. But they did have reins which are depicted on the coins. So one of the theories is that this represents jockeys riding his horses at the Olympics, which, given the emphasis Philip put on the Olympics, and remember, he renamed his chief queen Olympias after his Olympic victory, and also given the fact that we have coins of Philip showing his showing the chariots he raced at the games, this is, I think, a likely interpretation. Again, I'll give the usual caveat, this is speculation. And we are not entirely sure. We can just try to decide what makes the most sense to us. So with this sacred war done, we are not yet done with sacred wars. The third sacred war after 10 long years is over. But only 7 years later, you will see the fourth sacred war. And this war will be tied up with the final showdown and the most significant battle in the reign of Philip as the final showdown over control of Greece finally takes place. But this has already been a long episode, so it's time to wrap up. So, we'll see you next time in episode 3.6, Karanea. And since we have been away for so long, and since I'm starting to get a bit over-ambitious on my production schedule, along with section 3.6, I will also release a supplemental episode about a character who lived in this period has not really been discussed in detail in this podcast, but was mentioned today. Some have speculated that but for the accident of history, it is this individual who would have become the hegemon of Greece before the rise of Macedon and would have launched the Greek invasion of Persia, which he was actually planning. So along with episode 3.6, look for a supplemental episode in The Hegemon Who Never Was. So see you soon and stay safe, everybody. If you like this episode, please give this podcast a 5-star review on iTunes or the podcatcher from where you access this podcast. This is a new podcast and good reviews are essential in getting the word out. Thank you for your support.